Hi, I'm Carmel Fisher and we're at the LD Micro Conference, the 14th edition here in Bel Air, California. And with me I have Mr. Johnny Lai, all the way uh, from Axos Financial. Am I pronouncing that correctly? Uh, Axos is, is usually how we pronounce it, but it's fine. <laughs> <laughs> okay, got it. Well, welcome. We're very happy to have you here. Thanks for having us. Uh, Johnny, if you don't mind me calling that, would you mind please touching on an overview of what Axos Financial does? Uh, sure. So Axos Financial is a holding company. Uh, our primary businesses are in consumer and commercial banking. So in the banking businesses, we've got about $14.5 billion of assets. And that's anything from your traditional single family mortgages to consumer deposits to small business uh, banking accounts and other more specialized commercial real estate and commercial uh, lines of lending. Um, and then we also have a securities business that's comprised of Axos Invest, which is our direct to consumer um, commission free trading and also a digital wealth management. Uh, business, uh, and also there is a, a B2B component to it, which is Axos Clearing, and what that is, is um, we do clearing for approximately you know, 280 uh, different uh, introducing broker-dealers and independent RIA firms, and in Axos Clearing, we have about $42 billion of assets in the custody. Wonderful. There was a lot of activity in the uh, markets, you know, given the millennials apparently coming into the market and, and a lot of rulings being changed with the SEC in relation to that. Was there any impact that that had on Exos Financial? Um, for us, uh, directly, it really didn't have much of an impact. Um, our our direct-to-consumer securities businesses are a little bit newer. We've been in it for about four years. And I think the number of clients are in the 25, 26,000 range. Right. So I think just like a lot of you know folks opened up uh, a Robinhood account or a, right. a, a, a trading account because they have more time on their hands, they did more trading. And we saw more assets coming into our business as well, but probably not in a dramatic way. Um, and in, in terms of our clients, I think they... Uh, whether they're the broker-dealer clients or the independent RIA clients, I think they saw, you know, the markets rebound, and I think generally their uh, high net worth clients also put more money into the market because uh, generally they were doing well. Great. Just to take a step back and orient us to the history of Exos, and is there anything yeah. you'd like to, you know, familiarize us with? Yeah, sure. So. You know, Axos, once upon a time, at, at its, when it was forced, first born in the year 2000, uh, seems like a long time ago, but um, it was one of the first online banks, digital banks, and the original name was Bank of Internet, uh, because back then, Internet was actually this novel thing, and people were just learning about it and, and uh, figuring out what to do, and a lot of different consumer and, and commercial businesses were moving online. So we were one of the original uh, digital banks. And um, unfortunately, a lot of those others are no longer around and there are new competitors that have entered. But, uh, you know, we, we can say that we were one of the uh, original uh, digital banks out there. Yes, which is really valuable in understanding a previous market and then adapting and, and remaining constant in an ever-changing uh, landscape, correct? Right. Um, so having said that, let's touch on the competitive landscape and how you guys plan on staying in the lead or at least remaining relevant. Sure, yeah, so it's it's been a very interesting dynamic because just like a lot of other parts of the economy uh, with uh, the pandemic over the last year and a half, two years, a lot of these sort of secular trends have accelerated, right? So for example, um, you know, online banking at one point in time was considered to be sort of a niche, something that only, you know, younger people, more tech savvy people would right. gravitate toward. But when you have this extended period where you couldn't really access ATMs, you couldn't access branches, you couldn't get a hold of 
people because they were either not available or uh, they had limited hours. Um, people really then had to lean on other digital uh, ways of interacting. And that really, you know, helped our model because that's the way we've always thought about the world. Right. And, and I think the longer that people sort of use those channels, they were, before they were maybe a little bit more skeptical than wanted to pick up the phone or walk into a branch. And now they were kind of forced to not do that and just go online or, or get into their mobile app. They actually discover that it's much easier, right? Because they can do it at two o'clock in the morning or, you know, five o'clock in the afternoon, whatever it's more convenient for them, rather than waiting, getting in a car, driving somewhere. So I think a lot of those sort of more um, structural things play into our favor. I think the part that makes it a little bit more challenging is you have a lot of new, very good competitors coming into the market. Some of them are banks and regulated institutions. Others are not, like the Robin Hoods, right? right? And they are SEC regulated, but they're not really a bank, right? But they are starting to offer more bank-like services. So in some ways, they're trying to do what we were doing early on, which is start by offering one really good product and be really good at that, and with the hope that over time, their customer base is going to want to do more with them. Right. So that's always been our model, and we continue to do that. I think we're a little bit more mature in terms of the development of that. Um, but they also have, um, you know, access to a lot of, you know, either public market or private money. Uh, that's allowing them to to grow very fast. So. So they're very uh, formidable competitors for us. 100%. Well, taking me to the next question, what is the first plan in the newly acquiring E-Trade Advisor Services? Yeah, so we're, we were really excited to be able to close that acquisition in essentially four months, which um, for a deal of that size is actually quite, um, you know, quite an accomplishment. And, um, and I think um, both teams did spent a lot of time together and, uh, and we really accomplished a lot. Um, one of the first things that we were doing prior to close, which is now, it, it closed on August the 2nd of this year, is we converted it from a bank platform to a broker dealer platform. And not to get too technical or nerdy, but essentially by being on a broker dealer platform, um, we're now allowed to offer a wider variety of services to uh, end clients that um, previously they were not allowed to offer because they were not on a broker dealer platform. So right. things like margin trading, right. options trading, uh, securities baselines of credit, those types of things that their existing clients had always wanted to do, but they had to do it with another custodian, right. now they can do it with us. So that's very Wonderful. exciting. Wonderful. Yeah, definitely a great collaboration or partnership there. Um, so you've brought on a new executive VP. Do you want to touch on who that is and you know what plans you have? And advantages of having brought him on? Sure. So yeah, so Derek Walsh was uh, promoted to uh, a chief financial officer. Derek's been with the company for over eight years and he's been working with um, our CEO and our prior CFO, Andy Micheletti, for some time uh, with the plan of this ultimate transition. So he had a, had an increasing role in a number of financial reporting, regulatory reporting, and, and just kind of interactions with the board in terms of setting budgets right. and, and doing other types of, um, of, of strategic planning for some time. So he's very well immersed in that. And he's going to be doing more of these things with me right. over time because while he knows some of our shareholders and some of our uh, sell side analysts, he's not met all of them. Right. And and I think the goal over here in the next six, nine, 12 months, um, once we're uh, meeting people face to face in person, um, is that he gets more direct exposure with those folks. Awesome. Uh, speaking of shareholders, how do you guys manage 
the volumes of that? And do you know who your top shareholders are? Uh, yeah, so our shareholder base has evolved over time. We call it the first 10 or 15 years we were public. Um, we were growing very fast and we we're very profitable and we we're a smaller institution. So we probably attracted more of the small cap, micro cap growth investors. And we had more retail investors who said, wow, there's really not any other public digital banks out there. And I, I sort of like that trend and you're the only way I can invest in it. So we had a, a number of individuals, whether they came from family offices or uh, the retail brokerage community or people that just literally, you know, went on Motley Fool because right. we, we interacted with them, um, you know, in the past and they would write an article and they told us we were the like the most read article in, on their site, which was great. Wow. Um, and so as we've gotten bigger, as our market cap has increased um, and as our growth has sort of moderated more to the, you know, low to to mid-teens from 25, 30% before, mm -hmm. I think we've had more value investors uh, and more institutions. Mm -hmm. And we've actually even seen more of the international European investors who say, hey, I've seen this trend happen. You remind me of XYZ, wow. right? 10 right. years ago in my country in, in the UK or right. in, in uh, Canada. So we've had more institutional clients uh, express interest and and also uh, just take a position in our stock. Wonderful. Um, so a little bit more about you. Tell us yeah. more about your business background and, and where it all started for you. Yeah, so I, I've always been in finance uh, and I've always been very interested on the uh, investment management side. So for the first probably 10 or 12 years of my career, I was actually a buy side uh, analyst, uh, equity analyst and uh, portfolio manager. I actually worked here locally for a couple of different uh, firms. One was Bel Air Investment Advisors. I covered financials and, and uh, consumer uh, staples uh, for Bel Air. And I also was at uh, RNC Capital uh, in Brentwood. And uh, they're, they're a mix of institutional and high net worth money. And um, I worked with a team on a large cap in a, in a uh, growth product while I was there. So, um, you know, so I, I was more familiar with being on the other side of, right. of the table, asking the questions versus answering them. But, right. but I also, um, you know, had an appreciation for sort of the interactions with management and, and understanding capital markets and understanding managing expectations. Um, so I think those things have helped me transition to the corporate side. You know, I, in addition to running the IR piece of it, I'm also the head of corporate development. So I do, um, you know, I reach out to different companies, whether public, private, um, do mergers and acquisitions. We've probably done seven or eight while I've, I've been with Axos, and we've probably done a dozen uh, different um, partnerships. So those things sort of keep me balanced. You know, there are some times that are a bit busier on the calendar for IR stuff. Sometimes we, there's more uh, more M and transactions. So uh, there's never a dull moment. <laughs> I bet. <laughs> well, we are about to close off. Thank you so much. If there's any closing remarks you'd like to leave with our viewers right now, yeah. it would be a great time. Um, what takeaway basically would you want our viewers and investors and potential? or existing investors to take away from this? Yeah, I, I, I think that the two things I want to sort of uh, reiterate, I think a lot of our shareholders that have known us for a long time know this, but maybe it's not as, um, maybe it's not as talked about as frequently, but one is just the consistency in terms of our financial performance. Uh, we've been through now two and a half, I don't know if you call this a, a a, a you know recession. There was a very short recession, but we've been through the great re, you know financial crisis and the dot com bubble uh, and bust, and we've emerged stronger and and uh, very profitable. So that's one thing that um, where we have a track record of of being able to manage through uh, very turbulent times and still make money for our shareholders. That's one and two. I think is that. We're really well positioned 
in terms of our existing businesses to continue generating very good growth and very good profits and not have to reach and sort of deviate and make significant changes into our business model in order to continue the successes that we've had. So not to say that we're never trying to get better and trying to find different things to do to, um, to make more money for our shareholders. We are, um, but we don't need that. If we, if we did more deals, um, you know, those would just be more additive to what we're doing today. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Johnny. This was a great conversation. Uh, Exos Financial with the ticker AX. I'm Kamel Fisher, and we're signing off from Sequoia Spotlight.